Oh, there he is. There he is. Okay, guys, how you doing? Yeah, man, my eyes, I just took a nice shower. Just to let you know, I forgot my computer at the studio because I'm doing some shows. I did a live show with a dear brother in Jesus Christ named Hussein who left Islam, we became a follower of Jesus Christ. So I forgot my computer. And thanks to our brother, Idiotai Apologetics, not only has he been gracious enough to let me stay in his house, him and his lovely wife and children, so pray for them, pray for his wife and his uh, three children and grandchild. Let the Lord Jesus bless them and fill them with his love and joy and peace and provide for them. He's let me stay here for two weeks, not charging me. God bless his heart. He's actually now letting me use his computer. Talk about a gracious brother, man. I really don't deserve it. And I'm not just saying it because he's here, but it's the truth. It's been very gracious. Pray for him. Pray for his family. Pray for his ministry. He loves Jesus. He has a hunger to do apologetics. Pray that the Lord will use me in his life to disciple him. And make sure you subscribe to his YouTube channel, Idiotai Apologetics. You guys don't know why he's, uh, he calls it Idiotai? I want to know how many people know this. Let's see. Why do you think he calls his apologetic ministry Idiotai? Does anyone know? Let's see. I'm going to see if they know. Because that's the word used in Acts 4.13 to describe the apostles of Christ, Peter, James, and John, when they said that they were unlearned, idiotai. And that's where we get the word idiot. Right? So he's following the tradition of the apostles. It's in Acts chapter 4, verse 13. So he named his ministry in honor of the fact that Peter and John were called idiotai because they were shut the front door. You know what I mean? <laughs> is that his expression? Okay, I like that, Choose Jesus. That's one of those expressions, right? Shut the front door. Why, you wicked Chaldean. Only Chaldean Assyrians can take street slang and Christianize it. Shut the front door. <laughs> Lord Jesus, well, I'll be visiting you guys, right? So in Jesus' name. But please pray for him. Honestly, he's been nothing but gracious to me. He even loaned me a car so I don't have to rent a car and rent a room. I mean, that saves me money because we're in full-time ministry. So pray for this precious brother, right? Yeah, someone just said shut the front door. That was choose, uh, choose Jesus. So pray for this brother, right? Pray for me that the Lord Jesus will bless my time here and that I'll be a blessing to him. I'm here for several reasons, right? I'm going to a convention where I'm going to see Assyrians from all over the world. Pray that God will bless my time there, connect with people, and just, you know, love on people for the sake of Jesus, right? And in the meantime, keep my daughters in prayer because I'm far away from them for now. So, but let's begin. Ask the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ to bless this session, right? Father, we love you. Lord Jesus, we love you. Holy Spirit, we love you. Father, I know you don't need me. In fact, at times I'm a hindrance to people because of my imperfection. So, Father, thank you for using me for the glory of your Son. I ask that you wash us in the blood of Jesus and save us from our own flesh and our carnal desires. Save me, Father with these struggles, to walk in the power and life of the Holy Spirit. Bless everyone here. Fill them with your Holy Spirit, your presence, your love, and cover us by the blood of Jesus. Cover me with the blood of Jesus and cover our loved ones, my daughters, my angels, by the blood of Jesus. Wash them, Father. Provide for us and through us. Provide for them, Father. Father, anoint the sound of my voice to be pleasing to the ears of your servants. And Father, please enable me by the power of the Holy Spirit to <clears throat> rightly handle the word of truth. Save me from error misinterpretation from stammering and crucify my flesh not to be unnecessarily offensive but not to tickle ears ears as well father and father bless your people to understand by the power of the holy spirit because understanding comes from your spirit not from us not from me father and fill my lungs and my chest and my throat with the breath of life the health i need to glorify you and enable us to fall more passionately in love with jesus more of jesus less of us and save us from the attacks of the enemy. We thank you, Father. We love you. We thank you, Lord Jesus. We love you. We thank you, Holy Spirit. We love you. Have your way. And again, I just want to mention my dear brother, who's been so gracious, Father, to me because of his love for you. Bless him, his wife, his children, and grandson. Watch over them. Provide for them. Use him mightily in the power of the Holy Spirit. Father, please bless him for his graciousness towards me. I'm not able to repay him, but you can because you are a rich, heavenly Father, and you love him. And thank you for him. And I pray that I'll be a blessing in his life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen. Yahweh, Father, Son, and Spirit. Yahweh, Father, Son, and Spirit. All right.
you asked for it. You wanted to talk about Lucifer, visible appearances of God the Father, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about Isaiah 14. I'm going to talk about God the Father appearing visibly. And then, Lord willing, in the upcoming <clears throat> days, I'm going to then begin my series on Jesus and the Archangel Michael and refutation of that cult leader and heretic, Greg Stafford. Hopefully, by the grace of God, I can expose him to show he doesn't know the scriptures. And may God grant him repentance leading to life or use me to silence him for the glory of Christ. And then I'm also going to continue my series on Jesus and Psalm 110. If you're praying for me, if you're praying that God keeps me healthy and more importantly, holy for the Lord, right? Holy for the Lord and provide for me financially, and save me from my trials. I'll keep doing this. As long as God gives me life to serve him, I will serve him until Jesus takes me home. If that's what the Lord wants me to do, because he doesn't need me. And I'm not saying this to be humble. God doesn't need us. God raises us up by the power of the Holy Spirit <clears throat> to strengthen the church for the glory of Christ. It's Jesus who builds this church, and it's Jesus who raises up people to serve him. And it's an honor that the Lord would even look upon me. Pray I can truly love the Lord from my heart. So we're going to talk about that, because some of you asked for it, right? Isaiah 14, is it about Satan? We may get into Ezekiel 20. If that's what you want, that's what I titled it. Visible appearances of the Father. You know, I should have retitled that because it almost gives the impression that I'm talking about visible appearances of the Father, St. Lucifer, that St. Lucifer appeared. I'm going to retitle it afterwards, right? Yeah, yeah, that's going to miscommunicate, right? People are going to think that I'm going to talk about the Father appearing and Satan appearing and Lucifer appearing. Oh, well, that just tells you. I am Jilu. If you guys don't know, anyway, I'm not going to get into that. Yes. We got 49. That's the about 150. And we're getting there. I want to rival David Wood. I'm jealous of him. He gets about 1,000 people watching his boring programs, right? We need to get more, right? Yeah. We're going to get there. Zena, what's up? What's your question, Zena? Hey, there's a song they sing about you. Hey, Zena, I want to get a Fina. They're Mor Moroccan, I believe. Right? What is it, Zena? What's going on? What's your question? Yep, God willing. Idiota is here. Me and him are going to be doing some for his channel as well. Am I said famous? Well, not too famous, right? So, uh, brother, John, I love you, but don't you ever put David on my level. I love David, and it's because I'm being gracious and merciful to even stoop down to his level. Okay, you tell that hater that hater would. Zina, did you have a question? Say, Dennis, it's actually hard for me to find people to debate, Abdul. You know, I, you know, and everyone wants to debate. Slana, one thing I want to ask you to pray for me. One thing, I, and I mean this from my heart. <clears throat> I really mean this. Pray that God will save me and all the apologists, like David Wood and everyone else, from getting puffed up and believing our own press and the hype because what Satan wants to do, he wants us to get puffed up and believe the praises of our brothers and sisters so that we walk around thinking we're celebrities and rock stars. Pray that Jesus Christ, our Lord will save us from that because we are prone to becoming egotists and our hearts are idol factories. And by the way, choose Jesus as kosher. So you don't need to, you know, so pray for that, right? Because when you say I'm a legend, my flesh wants to feed off of that, and here's why. And I'm just being upfront. See, I try to be as honest as I can without causing people to stumble, okay? Here's why, folks. All my life, all my life, I've struggled with self-esteem. You may not see that because I come off very strong. So I struggle for, with self-esteem, and I crave the love and attention let me, I know people are going to hear this and they're going to attack me. Those who hate me are going to use this against me. You know, uh, my mother was a godly, when I say a godly woman, she was a wonderful mother. She sacrificed her life for me and my siblings, but she wasn't one who knew how to verbalize her love. She showed it by her actions, but she was very tough and stern. And so growing up, I always ached for the affirmation of my mother. I always ached for it. And that, that need is still there, right? See, Satan knows how to destroy homes because he knows if he destroys homes, he destroys children, and children grow up to be dysfunctional. And so all my life, I always wanted the affirmation of my mother. When I couldn't get her, her affirmation, because her love language wasn't verbalizing her love. 
her love language was to show it by her actions. But what I wanted was verbal affirmation. So in my heart, I crave the affirmation of a woman. In my heart, I crave it. I'm being honest with you. I'm trying to be as honest as I can because I'm a sinner, an imperfect vessel being perfected, washed, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. So because of that, when someone praises me, I'm afraid that I'm going to believe it and get puffed up. So pray for me. Pray for your brothers and sisters in Christ. Pray for David Wood that we do not believe the hype. We don't let it get to our heads and think we are superstars, right? But I'm being honest, that's my need. My, my craving is the affirmation of a woman because I look for the affirmation of my mother, you know? See, notice it all starts in your childhood and Satan knows that. Satan knows if he can destroy the home, then he destroys the children and the children grow up dysfunctional with needs that they seek to be met and, and filled. So pray for me that God will keep me humble. God will keep me teachable. God will keep me content and in love with Jesus and never believe the hype. I mean, you've heard David Wood and others say, David Wood in front of me. And even when I'm not around, he said it. He believes I'm the greatest apologist that God raised up against Islam in, in 1,400 years. Pray I never believe that, that I never believe that, right? Pray it never gets to my, to my head, please. Because I'm human and I've seen some brothers in Christ who have done great work for the Lord, who started believing the hype and the press that they were celebrities and God's gift to the church. And I'm not going to mention any names. And these are brothers that, that I look up to and I love. And I pray God will save them before they do irreparable destruction to their ministry. Right? So I just want to be upfront with you guys. Right? I'm a human being. I'm a broken vessel. Oh, okay, Jesus Christ is the truth. You said it, not me. <laughs> <laughs> Someone else said it too, not me. I'm not going to mention. And I love that brother. I do. I do love him. I do. Right? Pray that Jesus Christ will sustain me. I'm a broken vessel who has needs and desires. I'm human, right? And you know what's beautiful about Jesus? Let me tell you something what's beautiful about Jesus. Jesus deliberately, deliberately raises up broken vessels, imperfect instruments with issues that he could transform in a nanosecond because jesus is almighty he can transform me and heal me but he allows us to struggle with these imperfections for two reasons from my understanding of scripture here are the two reasons one to know that we are nothing without him and we absolutely need him and depend on him and two to prevent anyone from idolizing us and elevating us to godlike status So keep praying, keep praying. Who knows? Maybe the Lord will be pleased that on this side of eternity, I will meet that woman who loves Jesus and will love me for the sake of Jesus and affirm me for the sake of Jesus. Maybe, and maybe not. Because my ultimate healing will come when I stand before the Lord Jesus and bow before his feet. And then I will be filled with such a love, such a joy beyond understanding. And I will not need the affirmation of a woman anymore. So he may give it to me or he may delay it because ultimately at the end, our heart is created to be in love with Jesus and to be loved by Jesus. So his will be done. I may walk this journey alone till I die. I remember a title of a book and we're going to begin. I hope I'm not boring you with this, right? Right. I hope I'm not boring you with this. I'm trying to be as honest with you guys as possible to know that I'm not better than you. And I know I'm not better than you. And you know, I'm not better than you. I mean it. I saw a title of a book that stuck with me. In the book, the title was, it was a Christian book, and it moved me to tears because that's my story. Guys, this title of the book was, and I'm going to see, I'm going to start crying thinking about it. Mm. The title of the book was, Sometimes Lonely, But Never Alone. That's exactly, that describes me. Sometimes Lonely, But Never Alone. It was a Christian book. I didn't read it. I just looked at the cover, and it was a picture of a young man. What I remember to be a young man, and he looked lonely, but it said never alone. It meant because even though despite how he felt, Jesus was there sustaining him. And that's my story. For the past two years, I've been traveling the world by myself. For the past years, I've gone to more places than I have in the past 10 years. But you know one thing? Even though I meet brothers and sisters who love me and pray for me and I love them for the sake of Jesus. Do you know, brothers and sisters, wherever I go, I still feel 
lonely, that I'm all by myself? You know? But God is good. But I always know that despite how I feel, it's not about how I feel. It's about the promises of God, and God cannot lie. God cannot lie. Though I feel lonely, Jesus is with me. See, Sam Price? So you and me, right? We're broken vessels, humans, whom Jesus loves and adores. So Sam Price, I just wanted to be open and honest with all of you to know I'm not, I'm not this super Christian. I am not. I am not. I truly am not, right? And you see it. You see my issues, my anger, my impatience, right? And really, I don't want to be like this, but Jesus is beautiful. Amen. I hope that helped you, encouraged you. And I hope that helped you to see a little more of the real me and how to pray for me. How to pray for me. Folks, the Lord had used my two daughters since they were born to fill me. When I was with my daughters in their presence, putting them to sleep and waking up to them, the world was mine. I felt no loneliness whatsoever. But because of circumstances beyond my control, I haven't been able to be with them the way I'd like to be for two years. And I haven't put them to sleep in about two years. And I haven't woken up to their voices in about two years because of a corrupt, evil, wicked judge and a corrupt, evil, wicked system. But my God will vindicate me and my children. Now, with that said, are we ready? Yes, okay, BH2, do you really want to know the answer? Or are you just doing it to attack? BH2. Dos Fanny me. Are you asking sincerely or are you asking to attack? Because I want I want to be, be honest and open and on the record. Let me just see. She already is a Protestant believer. Her life is starting to become hell and misery. Whereas the Lord is honoring me, she's being disciplined, and I pray she repents. I don't pray for a destruction. Okay, BH2, let me tell you. He's asking me about do not convert to Islam. You guys know him? Abu Ismail, the Canadian Muslim who left Islam and produces some great videos against Islam. What's my beef with him? In reality, I had no beef. Let me be let me be honest again and on the record. When I found out that he had left Islam, this I think was over two years ago, I contacted him and I asked him about his journey. And this is what he told me. And I'll try to find the emails. He told me that he is studying various branches of Christianity and he was studying the Trinity and modalism and that he felt that affirming that God is three manifestations was more biblical and more Jewish than saying that God is three eternal persons. So this was the beginning of his journey, and I left him alone. I said, okay, I'll be praying that God guides you because he's just coming into the Christian faith and beginning his journey. But he was dabbling into modalism, the belief that there are three manifestations of a single person. They're not three eternal persons, right? I said nothing because he hadn't gone public with the fact that he had become a Christian and that he was still on a journey studying Christianity. And I trusted the Holy Spirit that would bring him to the fullness of the truth. Well, lo and behold, about two years later, he comes out with a video. And guys, if the video is still up, I want you to go and pay attention. In the video, he gets baptized by a oneness minister and oneness Christians who are anti-Trinitarians who baptize him only in the name of Jesus and start speaking in tongues. This is typical of this movement. They're known as the United Pentecostal Churches, where they don't believe there are three persons, but one person, assuming different roles, different manifestations, different modes, and they believe that you have to baptize in the name of Jesus only because the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit is Jesus and must speak in tongues. Right? Must speak in tongues. So when I saw that video, I knew that he had now become a oneness heretic, a full-blown oneness heretic, anti-Trinitarian. So I reached out to him and said, now are you a oneness? Come out and just confess. He refused. What made it worse, the day after his baptism, the day after his baptism, he then put up a GoFundMe page and did a video saying that he wants to go to Bible college and he needs $40,000 to go to college. That's when I said I had to expose him publicly. It's one thing for you to become a heretic, a oneness heretic. It's another thing not to be public about it in order to keep Trinitarian supporting you. See, he never went public because he knew that most of the Christians supporting him are Trinitarians and he didn't want to lose their financial support. To me, that's despicable. That is disgusting. That's dishonest. And that's when I decided to go public with it, right? 
He didn't like the fact that I went public. But you know what? My allegiance is to the triune God first, not to man. So if you guys want to hate me, and this is another thing that disgusts me. You have Trinitarians who were defending him and saw no problem with him becoming a oneness heretic. Trinitarians, it's do not convert to Islam. And then he challenged me to debate oneness ministers. And I told him, how do you know their names? There are Trinitarians who haven't even heard of these oneness apologists, but you know them. You know why he knew them? Because he was studying them. Right? And then invited me to debate. And that's how I ended up debating the oneness pastor, by the way. That oneness pastor, Steve, Steve Ritchie, chimed in to defend him against me. And I called him on and said, listen, stop barking here. Set up two debates and I'll come at my own expense and debate you. And we had the debates. And glory to Jesus Christ. I'm not trying to boast. It was a decimation. Pastor Stevie Ritchie got decimated by the triumph God. And the reason why I ended up debating Steve Ritchie is because of Ismail. He came to his aid to defend him. Why is the oneness defending him? Why is the oneness praising him? And why is he appealing to oneness and telling me to debate the oneness? And then he'll be convinced whether the Trinity is true or not. He's not a Christian. For now, he's a deceiver. That doesn't mean he won't become a Christian. And if you love the triune God, if you love the triune God, it's not about me. It's about the honor of the triune God. The oneness God is not the same as the triune God. If you love the triune God, you do not support this man. By subscribing to his page, sharing his videos, or supporting him financially. Don't do it. Don't do it. In fact, nothing he has said in his videos about Islam is new. I have been talking about the same issues, bringing out the same points. So has David Wood. Oops, hold on. I have been bringing out the same issues, the same arguments, the same facts. So has David Wood and others. You don't need his channel. Just because he speaks Arabic fluently, so what? So I hope that cleared the record, right? That set the record straight. Is it clear now? Send Dr. Hook on his merry way because I don't want to start bouncing people. Yeah, Acts 17, I will. After Monday, I'll be free. Acts 17, 11. In fact, folks, can I tell you something? Oneness is more dangerous than Islam. You know why? Can I tell you why it's more dangerous? And I want to begin the topic. No, not Christian Prince, man. Christian Prince is a Trinitarian. He even confessed it with me when he said one God, three persons. It's just the fact that English is not his first language, so he tends to sometimes miscommunicate. Of course, they're heretics, Jonathan Soko. Anyone who denies the Trinity knowingly and says Jesus is just a man or that there's one person, three modes, those are heretics worshiping a false god. To me, the Trinity is non-negotiable. Non-negotiable. Yep, not converted to Islam. Right? Okay. I was saying something, but I lost my train of thought. You remember what I was about to say right now? Something. <clears throat> yeah, that he, he converted to Islam. Yeah, there was something I was about to say, but this question made me uh, forget. Anyway, that's 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 my take on the matter. Until the man repents. Until he repents. Oh, yeah. I said oneness is more dangerous than Islam. Do you know why? Let me tell you why. Which religion do you think is more dangerous in deceiving people into thinking they're worshiping the God of the Bible? Oneness or Islam? Oneness will tell you Jesus is God. They say we praise the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We believe in the Bible. Muslims will tell you Jesus isn't God. The Bible's corrupt. The Quran is the word of Allah. Who do you think will be more dangerous and misleading someone into thinking he's worshiping the God of the Bible? The oneness heretic or the Muslim? So you see why this is more dangerous? Because it's packaged as Christianity. It uses biblical language. It even says the Bible is the word of God and Jesus is God. And that's it. Hey, Jesus God. Yes. Bible's word of God. Yeah. You praise Father, Son, and Spirit. Amen. Hallelujah. That's it. Sign me up. You see? The Muslim comes up and tells you the Bible's corrupt. Jesus isn't God. Allah is not a father. Oh, really? Then you can keep Islam. But when someone comes and tells you Jesus is God, I worship Father, Son, Holy Spirit, right? The Bible's word of God. You'll put your guards down and you'll be more open in hearing him out and embracing him as a brother. In fact, I'm actually going to go on the record right now again 
because it's coming out now and it's not to attack. You guys know that David Jonathan Lynn had a conference in Canada on evangelism, right? You guys remember that? He invited me to speak. I was going to be one of the speakers on how to witness the Muslims. I actually declined. I said, no. Do you know why? Do you know why I declined, folks? Because he had invited a oneness heretic named Marcus Rogers. Marcus Rogers was one of the speakers that he invited. And I confronted him, told him, Marcus is an anti-Trinitarian. He's a oneness heretic who's now trying to use this platform to bring Trinitarians and oneness together. So I declined and said, I'm not coming. Unless you want me to come to debate him, I'll do that. But if he's coming and speaking, I decline because I will not come to a conference where you have a oneness heretic who worships the false god. That's why David Jonathan Lynn right now in his recent Facebook post posted something about that because I just confronted him again. Because yesterday he put a post on Facebook saying, Jesus is the spirit of truth, the spirit of God. And I chided him for that. I go, no, he isn't. The Bible describes the Holy Spirit as the spirit of truth and the spirit of God. For you to say that Jesus is the spirit of truth, the spirit of God, again, will miscommunicate because it will give the impression that you're saying that Jesus is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is Jesus. And surprise, surprise, go read the comment section. You have oneness heretics amening him and praising him saying, yes. Right, And yet David Jonathan says he's a Trinitarian who loves the Trinity and he opposes the oneness theology. Then why is he speaking as a oneness and why was he willing to have a oneness heretic speak at his conference? Guys, can you go ask him? Because in one of the messages he's saying you're being a bully. I said, I don't care what you call me. right? And appealing to motion won't work with me. I'm going to call you out for the glory of the Chinese God. And I'm trying to be a champion, but this is what's happening here. We are compromised. And the danger about David Jonathan Lynn is he's now being presented as a hero who went to jail for Jesus. Right? And so now we're emotionally charged. He went to jail for Jesus. Really? And yet when it comes to the Trinity, right? He's not as well guarded in his defense against heretics, supposed Trinity, and even the language. Go see. Go see his post yesterday. Jesus is the spirit of truth, truth of God. Amen? No, not amen. He's not the spirit of truth or the spirit of God. The spirit of truth is the title that Jesus gives to the Holy Spirit. And the spirit of God is the Holy Spirit. Jesus is the son of God, not the spirit of God. What are you talking about? Okay. So... And I'm not going to be surprised if he's going to come out to attack me personally and come up with my personal problems. That's okay. That will then expose his heart, right? If he truly loves the triumph God, he'll accept correction and confess and repent. If he loves the triumph God, may God have mercy on him. But anyway, enough of that. You brought it up, and I hope that answered the question. Did that answer the question about why I went after Ismail and exposed him? Folks, to me, the Trinity is a non-negotiable issue. Yes, Kay Johnson, the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Christ, but he's not Christ. Spirit of Christ means the Spirit that belongs to Christ, right, <clears throat> that is sent out by Christ, whom Christ has authority over, right? Spirit of, like when you say Son of God. Son of God means he belongs to God, he's subject to God, and God has authority over him. But it doesn't mean that he is God the Father, right? Is that clear? To so say that Jesus is referred to as a life-giving spirit no more proves that Jesus is the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth, the Spirit of God, than when God the Father is said to be spirit proves that God the Father is the Holy Spirit. Pan Aji. 1 Corinthians 15, 45 doesn't help your case. Because yes, Jesus as God is spirit. Because the nature of God is spirit. God the Father is spirit. The Holy Spirit is spirit. But just because God the Father is spirit doesn't mean he's the Holy Spirit. Just because Jesus is a life-giving spirit doesn't mean he's the Holy Spirit. Because there, the word spirit means something other than the Holy Spirit. Okay? I think I'm going to have to do an in-depth series on the Trinity. Right? But real quickly, real quickly, Pan Aji, okay? real quickly, when you say God the Father is spirit, in John 4, 24, it means that God's nature is spiritual. 
that the nature of God is spirit. What does that mean that God's nature is spirit? It means it's non-physical. It's it's incorporeal. It's not material. It's not physical. It's not bodily, right? And God by nature is not bound to time, space, and place. Basically, God is spirit means that God the Father by nature is invisible, formless, shapeless, timeless. That's all it means. And then when Paul calls Christ a life-giving spirit, because Jesus possesses the nature of God. So as God, he too is spirit in the sense that as God, he is immaterial, invisible, incorporeal, bodiless, shapeless, who is not bound to time, space, and place. I have some videos on my YouTube channel on the Trinity, the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament, New Testament, Jesus Christ appearing as the messenger of God in the Old, in the Old Testament. So at least watch those videos for now. And Lord willing, if God gives me the health and holiness, I will go in-depth on all these issues. Yes, I know Kay Johnson, but it's a heresy. And it's ironic because this is a heresy that was condemned in the early church by Tertullian and others, right? Against Praxius and I believe against Novation. Two oneness heretics. That Now is that everyone okay now? Now that we got it out of the way, can we go into the topic? No, Melchizedek is not Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. Melchizedek is not Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. Okay? He's not. Anyway, with that said, and, I'll, and I've written an article on it, and I'll talk about that. The reason why, you want me to give you a quick answer to that? You guys want a quick answer why Melchizedek is not Jesus Christ in the Old Testament? You guys want a quick answer? Okay, Hebrews 7.3 and Hebrews 7.15. Hebrews 7.3, Hebrews 7.15. Exactly, Sam Price, you got it. Okay, Hebrews 7.3, Hebrews 7.15. Thank our brother, Protestant believer, for posting verses. Serving me to serve you. God bless him and his family and watch over him and all of you as well. Notice about Melchizedek, without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days, nor in the love, but like, but made like unto the Son of God. Go back, get your Strong's Concordance if you don't know the Greek. The word is aphomoio, means he resembles the Son of God. He is like the Son of God. Well, if he's made like the Son of God, that means he's not the Son of God. And then Hebrews 7.15, speaking of Jesus, and it says in Hebrews 7.15, read this, and it is yet far more evident for that after the similitude of Melchizedek, there ariseth another priest. So Jesus is like Melchizedek, similitude of Melchizedek, and Melchizedek is like Jesus. So Melchizedek resembles Jesus, and Jesus resembles Melchizedek. Well, if I resemble you, and you resemble me, I'm not you, you're not me. Exactly, James Bond. Right? I'm not you, you're not me. I resemble idiotai. Idiot, idiota is like me. He's similar to me. Well, that means I'm not him. He's not me. Right? But Melchizedek was described in such a way, Melchizedek was described in such a way to point to the ultimate reality. In other words, Melchizedek is a shadow of a greater reality. Melchizedek was described as having no parents because his parents are not mentioned. Right? His death is not mentioned. These things were deliberately left out by the Spirit to make Melchizedek appear as a mysterious, eternal being because he's going to be a picture of the one who is eternal, who is beginningless, whose days never end. But by his holy cross, who told you that Abraham saw Jesus when he saw Melchizedek? What's wrong with you by his holy cross? Abraham had many encounters with Jesus. Melchizedek wasn't one of them. Abraham saw Jesus in Genesis 15, the word of Yahweh coming to him, Yehovah. Abraham saw Jesus in Genesis 18. Why do you have to go to Melchizedek passage to show that that's where he saw Jesus? No, by his holy cross. That's not one of the appearances of Jesus to Abraham. Where did Abraham see Jesus? When did Jesus appear to Abraham? One of the places is Genesis 15. Another of those places is Genesis 18. Is that clear now? The back of God, Sam Price, was Jesus Christ appearing to Moses along with the Father. If you read the Exodus carefully, 
Father, Son, and Holy Spirit all appeared to Moses. So the back of God is Jesus Christ with the Father. All three persons of the Godhead descended during the time of the Exodus to assist Moses in bringing Israel out of Egypt through the wilderness into the promised land. All right, now are we ready? Do you guys want to talk about Satan and Lucifer? Are you guys ready? Because we've gone into a lot of side issues, but still we're important, relevant, right? And let me repeat, folks, let me repeat. Anyone who claims to be a Christian but compromises with oneness heretics and gives them a platform, even if it's David, Jonathan, Lynn, or anyone who becomes a oneness but does damage against Islam, but he's a oneness heretic, don't you dare support them. Don't you dare subscribe to their pages. Don't you dare <clears throat> bring people to their ministries. Pray for them to repent and hold them accountable to repent. But don't you, in clear conscience, if you love and adore the triune God, support their ministries until they repent and get right. All right? Yes, don't convert to Islam is a oneness heretic. In fact, he came on one of the shows with David Wood and I and said that the Trinity is tritheism. He actually came out after me exposing him and said the Trinity is tritheism, three gods. Don't you dare support these people, folks, if they're not Trinitarian who worship the triune God. There's one thing to be ignorant about the Trinity. It's another thing to know the Trinity and oppose it and condemn it or give platform to those who condemn the Trinity. He is, Zena. He's become shady. You don't believe me? Go see his recent posts. Okay, now let's talk about Satan and Lucifer. Do you guys want me to start with that? It is said. That's one non negotiable. I will not compromise on the Chime God. I'm willing to be open minded about other things, not when it comes to God being triune. Jesus being the God-man, right, conceived of the virgin, raised physically bodily, and returned physically bodily. That These things I cannot compromise. You're not my brother or sister if you deny these. All right. Let's come back to, is Satan Lucifer? Is Lucifer Satan? You guys ready for that? Lord willing, I want to get these questions out of the way so I can then start my series on Jesus not being the Archangel Michael. An exposition of that heretic and cult leader, Greg Stafford. I hope he's watching these videos. I'm calling you out to debate me if you have the courage. My challenge is simple. Let's debate is Jesus, the Archangel Michael, if you really think you know the Bible. Okay? And then tell him I'm calling him out. And then continue my series on Jesus and Psalm 110.1. Right? Is Satan Lucifer? Is Lucifer Satan? Quick answer. Quick answer. He used to be a Jehovah's Witness. He started his own cult following called Christian Witnesses of Job. He's a cult leader. He started a modern cult movement. Is Saint Lucifer? Is Lucifer saying? Quick answer, no. If you mean, is the figure called Lucifer in Isaiah 14 Satan? No. The figure in Isaiah 14 is not Satan. However, because of the impact and the power and the majesty of the King James Bible, right? People reading Isaiah 14, assuming that it is Satan, have now identified Lucifer with Satan so that now when you say Lucifer, everyone knows who Lucifer is. It's the devil. Are you with me there? Let me let me again be quick and, and try and articulate this point. Then we're going to unpack Isaiah 14. Okay. Because of the beauty, the majesty, and the power of the King James Bible, being the chief translation for over 300 years, unrivaled, and to this day, the best-selling Bible, right, for English-speaking Christians, the beauty and majesty of this translation. God has been pleased, even till now, to make this the king of all English Bibles, right? Because of its influence, because of its majesty, because of its beauty, it has impacted Western culture. It's one of the most influential pieces of English literature, right? And it's not just literature. It is God's word. And I dare say, stone me if you want, God's perfect words in English. Go ahead and stone me. Fine. But what I'm saying is, because of its influence, people reading Isaiah 14, 
Follow with me. People reading Isaiah 14 and assuming that speaking of Satan made the connection between Lucifer and Satan in that thinking it's Satan, they came to see that Satan's name is Lucifer. And it's caught on even among Satanists. Even Satanists have been influenced by the King James Bible. And by the way, the King James translators were not the first to use the word Lucifer in Isaiah 14, 12. The translations that came before it also use the term Lucifer from the Latin in Isaiah 14, verse 12, right? But because the King James Bible became the chief translation for English-speaking churches, right? Even Satanists have adopted the moniker Lucifer for Satan. So they call themselves Luciferian and refer to Satan as Lucifer, right? Do you see the power and the majesty of the King James Bible? That even Satanists call themselves Luciferian and call Satan their dark lord, Lucifer, because of the influence of the King James Bible. You see how powerful the, that Bible is? And folks, I know some of you don't believe it's the best translation. That's fine. But be careful in knocking it because God in his sovereignty and providential good pleasure, God in his sovereignty <clears throat> permitted, if not decreed, if you want to be a Calvinist, that the King James Bible would become the chief Bible, unrivaled Bible for English-speaking churches for over 300 years. God must have been pleased with all of its readings and even the manuscripts that your translators used. Sorry, I'm, I'm sorry, sorry, I, I buffeted. That means God must have been pleased with the manuscripts that the translators used to produce this translation and all the readings that are contained therein. He didn't have a problem with it because he did nothing to make sure that the translators didn't use those particular manuscripts or those specific readings. If God didn't have a problem with it, but allowed it to become part of the chief Bible, the unrivaled Bible for English-speaking Christians for over 300 years, then I don't have a problem with it. Condemn me as naive, stupid, I don't care. If my God permitted this to be a translation based on manuscripts that contain ratings that modern textual critics say are defective or not original, not found in the earliest witnesses. I don't care. You know, I don't care because God guided the church to those manuscripts and permitted the church to use those manuscripts to produce what became the unrivaled chief translation for English speaking Christians all over the world. A translation that contains Mark 16, 9 to 20, the longer ending of Mark. A translation that contains John 7, 53 to 8, 11, the story of the woman caught in adultery. A translation that contains 1 John chapter 5, verse 7, which says, There are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. For 300 years, English-speaking Christians quoted these passages as, Thus saith the Lord, and God had no problem with it, neither do I. I know this is not a scholarly argument, but I'm not making a scholarly argument. I'm making an argument based on God's sovereignty, fidelity, faithfulness, <clears throat> and making sure his church has a sure word to follow. With that said, with me there now? With that said, is Lucifer and Isaiah 14 Satan? No. What's the evidence? Are you ready for the evidence? I'm, are you ready for the evidence? Okay. We're going to read Isaiah 14, verses 3 to 11. But before we do, the Bible does mention three spirit creatures, three spirit beings, creatures, angelic creatures, <clears throat> But Lucifer is not one of them, okay? The Bible mentions the archangel Michael. The Bible mentions Gabriel, who stands in the presence of the Lord, and mentions a third angel, a created angelic being, a third. It's not Lucifer. Can anyone tell me who that third angel is that's mentioned, 
whose name is given in the Holy Bible? Not right. Well, you know what? You got me on that, Raul. Yeah, okay. I forgot. I forgot. Many Christians here also accept the Deutero Deuterocanonicals, the Apocrypha. Okay, let me qualify that. Okay, let me. <laughs> I forgot. Okay, if you're Roman Catholic Orthodox and you accept the Deuterocanonicals, meaning the Apocrypha, what we call the Apocrypha, for angels. If you reject the book of Tobit and do not believe it's canonical scripture, three angels. Thank you, Raul. I forgot. Not everyone is a Protestant, and there are people who follow a larger canon of the Bible who accept more books in the Old Testament than the Protestants and the Jews do. Okay. If you're Catholic, Orthodox, Nestorian, Coptic, and accept the Deuterocanonicals, then four angels are mentioned by name. Raphael. In the book of Tobit, Michael, Gabriel. Is there a Safriel in the Apocrypha? Then maybe five. I know Raphael is definitely mentioned. I'm not aware in the list of Apocryphal books that the Orthodox, but you know what? The Ethiopian Orthodox Church accepts the book of Enoch. Oh, boy. I'm going to cause myself trouble. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah, I forgot. The Ethiopian Orthodox Church accepts the Book of Enoch. And in, in, in that book, seven angels are named. Raphael, Uriel, Gabriel, Michael, and some others. You know what? Let's just keep it simple, stupid. And I'm talking to myself. Kiss. Keep it simple, stupid. I'm just going to stick with the Jewish canon of 39 Old Testament books and the New Testament canon of 27. Just to make my point easier. Okay, guys? There is an angel mentioned besides Michael and Gabriel. And it's found in Revelation 9-11. Revelation 9-11. Revelation 9-11. Let's go there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm going to make it more complicated because I forget. The Ethiopian Orthodox Church have 81 books of the Bible, the largest canon of any Christian group. And one of those books is the book of Enoch, which they consider scripture. Okay. Revelation 9, 11. And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name, here's the angel, a sign to rule over the abyss, the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue hath his name Ap Apollyon, not Abandon. Abaddon, Apollyon. Michael, Gabriel, Abaddon in Hebrew. Apollyon in Greek. Anyway, Lucifer is not the name of Satan. Let's now break it down. Let's break it down. I'm going to have to retitle the video. Are you ready for me to break it down? Let's read Isaiah 14, verses 3 to 11. I need your undivided attention. No, he's not a dem demoniac. He's an angel that God created to rule over the abyss, and he's the one who's going to bind Satan. For a thousand years. Before we go to Isaiah 14, 3, 11, The Lord Jesus created this angel. Who's given authority. Over the bottomless pit. <clears throat> has given him the power. To bind Satan in the bottomless pit. For a thousand years. This angel called Abaddon. Apollyon. Go to Revelation 20 verses 1 to 3. Let's get that out of the way. Because we are talking about Satan. Revelation 20, verse 1 to 3. Man, people are going to think I'm weird. They're going to say, man, we can't label this guy. We can't put him in one camp. He affirms the biblical basis for the communion of saints, but he's not Catholic. He's not Orthodox. He's not Nestorian. He praises the King James Bible as being the perfect translation in English. This guy is weird. The dude is weird. Yeah, I am weird. I got issues. Anyway, Revelation 20, verses 1 to 3. Let's read. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless bit, pit revelation 9 11 that's the angel abaddon apollyon same angel in revelation 9 and verse 11 we're, we're given his name he had the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand and he laid hold on the dragon that old serpent which is the devil and satan and bound him a thousand years <clears throat> and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. How many of you have been told? Okay, yeah. 
Thank you, Jonathan. I love you. Because you see, I'm trying to be as faithful to scriptures as possible, though I do so imperfectly. How many of you have been told that Satan was the most powerful of God's angels? How many have been told Satan is, was the most powerful, the most beautiful of God's angelic creatures? Okay. Can I ask you a question? If Satan is the most powerful angelic creature there is, how then did Abaddon, Apollyon, the angel of the abyss, have the power to bind him up and lock him up into the bottomless pit? Can you explain that to me? Yes, I am the best looking, Zarena, best looking Christian apologist. How, how could Satan be the most powerful angelic creature when Abaddon, Apollyon, the angel of the bottomless pit, who was given the key to the bottomless pit, was so powerful he could bind Satan in chains and lock him up in the abyss. Secondly, if Satan is the most powerful angelic creature, how then was Michael and his angels able to hurl Satan and his angels to the earth, barring him from heaven? Revelation 12, 7 to 9. Revelation 12, 7 to 9. How can Lucifer be equal in strength to the archangel Michael when Michael will bar Satan from heaven, cast him out of heaven to the earth, where he'll no longer be able to go before God in heaven? Revelation 12, 7 to 9. In fact, let's read Revelation 12, 7 to 12. Revelation 12, 7 to 12. Revelation 12, 7 to 12. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not. They couldn't defeat Michael and his angels. Neither was their place found anymore in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out. That old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, <clears throat> which accused them before God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. How do believers conquer Satan, defeat Satan? By the blood of Jesus covering us. And by the word of their testimony, confessing Jesus as Lord. And being willing to die as martyrs and not being afraid. And they love not their lives unto death. And then verse 12. Verse 12. Therefore rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. For the devils come down unto you having great wrath because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. Did you guys catch it? Michael, more powerful than the devil. Because he hurled them to the earth and barred them from heaven. The angel Abaddon, Apollyon in Greek, more powerful than the devil. Because he was powerful enough to chain the devil and lock him up in the abyss for a thousand years. Clear? Thank you, Ray Russo. Is that clear or no? So... You found at least two angelic creatures more powerful than Satan. Michael and the angel of the abyss, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and Greek Apollyon. So we have Michael, Gabriel, Abaddon in Hebrew, Apollyon in Greek. Revelation 9, 11, Revelation 20, verse 1 to 3. Hope you learned something new, and I pray the Holy Spirit will continue to fill me with wisdom and knowledge, understanding of the scriptures, so I can keep teaching you for the glory of Christ. Yes, Apollyon is a good angel. Because he is the angel that binds up demons and Satan in the abyss, which is a good thing. Right? Which is a good thing. Okay. Is Satan Lucifer in Isaiah 14? No. Let's prove it. You guys ready now? You ready for the evidence? All right, we're going to read Isaiah 14, verses 3 to 11. Isaiah 14, verses 3 to 11. We're going to break it down into two sections. Pay attention to the context. This is the time to read and focus. Don't comment too much so you don't miss the verses. Let's see if you get it. Isaiah 14, verses 3 to 11. Let's see 
if the context is about Satan or someone else. Revelation 9, 11, Bill Thompson. Revelation chapter 9, verse 11. Now let's read. And it shall come to pass in the day that Yehovah shall give thee rest from thy sorrow. Chan, you're not paying attention. I'm going to prove Lucifer is an angel. So why are you asking me, do angels have free will when Lucifer isn't an angel? Pay attention. Learn by the grace of God. And it shall come to pass in the day that Yahovah shall give thee rest from thy sorrow and from thy fear and from the hard bondage wherein thou wast made to serve. Pay attention. <clears throat> Verse 4. Who is Isaiah talking about? Verse 4, folks. That thou shalt take up this proverb against the king of Babylon. Bam. This entire chapter is about the king of Babylon, the human king of Babylon. Pay attention. And say, how hath the oppressor seized, the golden city seized? Yahovah hath broken the staff of the wicked and the scepter of the rulers. He who smote the people in wrath with a continual stroke. He that ruled the nations in anger is persecuted and none hindereth. Okay, let's read. The whole earth is at rest and is quiet. They break forth into singing. Yea, the fir trees rejoice at thee. And the cedars of Lebanon saying, since thou art laid down, no feller is come up against us. No one has come to chop down our trees anymore since the king of Babylon has been destroyed. Watch here, Isaiah 14, 9 to 11. Pay attention. Hell from beneath is moved for thee to meet thee at thy coming. When I send you to hell, king of Babylon, it stirs up the dead for thee, even all the chief ones of the earth. It hath raised up from their thrones of the kings of the nations. Now notice 10, 11. All they shall speak and say unto thee, art thou also become weak as we? You mighty king of Babylon who wrecked havoc on the earth, you become nothing like us? You're now in hell with us? You're in hell with us. And by the way, this tells you the spirits in hell, Hades, are conscious and alert because they're having conversations when the king of Babylon comes down to join them, right? All they shall speak and say unto thee, Art thou also become weak as we? Art thou become like unto us? Nothing? Humiliated? Brought to the pit of Hades? Thy pomp, your arrogance, is brought down to the grave. And the noise of thy vials. The worm is spread under thee, and the worms cover thee. Question. From verses 3 to 11, Isaiah is talking about who? Who is he talking about? Who's going to be covered with worms when he's killed, buried, and his soul goes to Hades, to hell, to join the other wicked kings of the nations? Who is he talking about? Isaiah 14, 3 to 11. Donna, you're killing me. Donna, we're going to try it again. Go back and reread the passages because you're not paying attention. Yes, Hades and Sheol are the same. Sheol in Hebrew, Hades in Greek, it refers either to the grave or to the place where the spirits went to when they died. You want me there? Okay, Donna. So everyone saw it's the king of Babylon, right? Let's look at verse 4 one more time. Verse 4 one more time. I love you guys. Don't say, okay, I don't agree with me. Read it, Donna. I want you to read it and see it for yourself. Don't just take my word for it. That thou shalt take up this proverb against the king of Babylon. Speaking about Babylon, right? The king of Babylon? <clears throat> you got to distinguish Gehenna Medic. Now, Medic, you're asking me questions that are going to take me off topic. And I know you mean well because you're a regular and you love the Lord. I don't want to be harsh with you. But you notice what you're doing now? You're changing the subject. Why such a short attention span, brother? Gehenna is not the same as Hades. They're two different places. Please don't change the subject. Isaiah 14, 4. One more time. That thou shalt take up this proverb against the king of Babylon and say, How hath the oppressor seized the golden city seized? I know he loves me and I love him, but he's got to be patient because he wants answers to too many questions. But you got to be patient, brother. Right? You got to be patient. Okay? So who is it talking about? Yes. 
The metaphorical spiritual meaning, Ger Gerard Perry, will be used in Revelation to refer to any kingdom, any ruler, who was just as wicked as the kings of Babylon, who wrecked the havoc and evil that the king of Babylon did, and who oppressed the people of God like the king of Babylon did. So the king of Babylon becomes a type of any and every evil, wicked, tyrant, ruler who spreads evil, wickedness, immorality, and oppresses the people of God. But everyone saw in Isaiah 14, 4, it's the king of Babylon. You see it? Before I move on to the next part, you guys see, you sure? So then let's look at verse 11 one more time. Verse 11. In verse 11, verse 11, who is Isaiah referring to in verse 11? Isaiah 14, 11. Thy pomp, your arrogance, is brought down to the grave, and the noise of thy vials. The worm is spread under thee, and the worms cover thee. Who is going to be brought to the grave, and whose soul is going to go to Hades to join the other wicked rulers whose soul are now in Hades in torment, waiting judgment? And who will be covered with worms? In verse 11. Okay, you guys see it. It's the king of Babylon, right? King of Babylon? So then now let's look at verse 12. Surprise, surprise. Verse 12. Guys, now you answered it for yourselves. Verse 12. Read. Verse 12, watch. How art that fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? Bam! So is Lucifer Satan or the king of Babylon? And I'll explain what it means he's fallen from heaven. Just be patient. Don't get excited. If I just follow the context, who is Lucifer here? If I just follow the context. 3 and 11, and I read 12. Who's Lucifer? Chan, don't ask me that question. Answer my question, friend. Don't give me our time, man. Thank you. In the context, it's the king of Babylon. That's number one. Number two, not you, Sam Price. I'm talking to Chan. Number two, Lucifer is a Latin word. Lucifer is a Latin word. Do you really expect me to believe that God gave Satan a Latin name before Latin was invented? So when God created Satan, he named him Lucifer. That's his name? Because that's what you're saying. You're saying his name is Lucifer. Lucifer comes from the Latin translation of the Old Testament. When the Hebrew Old Testament was translated into Latin, the word Helen was translated as Lucifer. So do you really think that when Satan was created, God called him Lucifer? So where do you get his name is Lucifer? Why don't you say his name is Helel? Because in Hebrew it's Helel ben Shachar. Shining one, son of the morning. Helel ben Shachar. No Trinity Truth Channel. You can believe what you want. You need to prove it. You need to prove that he's now talking about the spirit. I'm not going to let you get away with assuming things you don't, <clears throat> you can't prove. Stop chiming in. Be patient, brother. Be patient, because I'm going to show you, no, you're not right. You're not correct. Okay, here, let me show you what the Hebrew is. Let me get you the lexicon. Guys, I don't need too many chiefs. I need Indians. This is the time to listen and learn. Go back and study. If you agree, disagree with me, keep it to yourself. Don't try to convert me to your position. I'm just giving you the evidence. You do with, with the evidence as you deem fit. The Holy Spirit will guide us into all the truth. But here. Let me get you the Hebrew to see it's not Lucifer. It's Helel ben Shachar. Here you go. Click on the link. Click on the link. Not Halal. That's Islam. Helel. Here you go. Oh, sorry. Wrong one. Sorry. That's Genesis. Wait one second. 
Thank God for modern, modern technology. Here you go. This is it. This is the link. This is it. Click on it, folks. Click on it, folks. I'm going to post it again. I want to bring the people of God together by the power of the Holy Spirit for the glory of Jesus Christ. Trinity Truth Channel, set up a debate in your church. We're going to record it, and I promise you I will decimate you and bury you and expose you for the ignorance that you are. You don't know me, and I'm not politically correct. I muzzle dogs, and it will be my pleasure to muzzle you. So bark away. Send this guy to Asheron. <laughs> and it's a shame he calls himself Trinity Truth. Okay. Send this guy to Asheron. Okay, do you see what the name is? People are like, man, I don't see Jesus and Sam. Where's the love, Sam? I don't see you. You're not loving. Well, if you want loving preachers, there are plenty of them on YouTube. If you want a mean jerk who knows he's a mean jerk and he's Jesus to save him, stick around, folks. Halel ben Shachar. You see it there? Now let me go to the Blue Letter Bible because we have a gentleman who pronounces the words for us. And I like his voice. He's got one mean voice. Quite cute and alluring. Here you go. I'll debate you, Samoon. Shamoon, I'll debate you. And yeah, you're going to destroy me like the clown that I am, but I'll still debate you. I debated Sham Shamoon. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I got issues. Let's see if we can hear the sound. Here you go. Strong's H, 1966. Hey, Leo. Hey, Leo. You catch it? Here's the link. Let me hear it again. What's it? What's his name? Strong's H, 1966. Hey, Leo. Hey, Leo. There you go. Hey, Leo. Okay, so why would we say that the name of Satan is Lucifer when Latin didn't exist at the time of Isaiah? It came later on. And Isaiah is written in Hebrew. Why don't you say that Satan is Halel? So why don't we have Halelians? Do we have any Halelians? Why is it Lucifer, Luciferian? Halelians. Okay. So now let's go back to Isaiah 14, 12 to 15. Sandeep, I heard you, brother. Just keep praying. Let's go to Isaiah 14, 12 to 15. Why then is this being described as being hurled from heaven? Isaiah 14, 12, 15. This is where I need you guys to pay attention now. Pay attention. Because I want you to focus as I unpack this. Read with me. How art, thou, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations? See, it's the same king who weakened the nations. But guys, pay attention. Why is he being thrown from heaven? Pay attention to the sequence. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high, yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. Now do you understand why he's being hurled from heaven? Not because he existed in heaven, because he's on earth who wants to ascend to heaven to rival God. And God says, when you do that, I'm going to hurl you back to the ground into hell. Thank you, basic. I need it. Did you catch it? No, Halel means shining one. It's Ben Shachar that means son of the morning, Roscoe. Okay, did you catch why he's being hurled to the ground? Let's look at Isaiah 14, 12, 15 one more time. It's because in his arrogant heart, he's now going to try to ascend to heaven to rival God, ascend above the stars, the angels. And God says, when you do that, I'm going to hurl you down to the earth, in fact, to hell itself, because you are no God and you cannot rival me. In other words, this being didn't exist in heaven. He's on earth who wants to ascend to heaven. Do you catch it now? If you read context, do you understand? Read the passages to yourselves. He says in his heart, I'm going to ascend above the stars. I'm going to be like the Most High. I'm going to ascend to God. So this being didn't start off in heaven. He starts off from the earth. And his arrogance wants to now ascend to heaven, rival God, 
and become greater than the stars. In other words, this is not Satan if you believe Satan's origin is in heaven. If Satan's origin is in heaven from where he fell, then how can you say Lucifer is Satan when Lucifer is on the earth ascending to heaven? And once he ascends, God will then hurl him back to the earth and into hell itself. Ejected where? He was never in heaven, Raul. Are you understanding my point? Thank you, Kay Johnson. You got it. You got it. This being was never in heaven. He's on earth, who in his arrogance says, I'm going to ascend to heaven, become God's rival, higher than the stars. And God says, oh yeah, once you do, I'm going to damn you to hell. I'm going to hurl you to the earth. So are you sure this is Satan? Did Satan originate from the earth and ascend to heaven from where he fell? Or is he a heavenly being from where he fell? So if he's a heavenly being, then how can he tell me Lucifer in Isaiah 14 is Satan? This being is on earth. This being is a king, a king of Babylon, a place on earth. In other words, it's a human being who thinks he's a god. Okay, let me explain the historical context. Raul, brother, I don't want to bounce you because you've confused too many issues. Who told you Lucifer in Isaiah 14 is Satan in the book of Job? Why are you confusing different books? Who told you Satan challenged God in the book of Job? Satan is challenging God's judgment, yes, in one sense, but he's not there to oppose God. He's there to get permission from God to tempt the righteous on earth. I don't know if you know this, folks, but Satan has to be given permission by God to tempt the people of God. You guys are too confused because you guys are not listening and being patient. Medic, that's your fault for confusing yourself. Why are you going to the book of Job which has nothing to do with Isaiah 14? Why can't you focus on Isaiah 14, brother? Sam Price, I'll answer that question in a minute. Remember Sam Price's question. Okay, do you understand now that this king is a human king on earth? who wants to ascend to heaven, and God says, what do you do? I'm going to damn you to hell and hurl you back to the ground and make your gra grave a bed of worms. You got it now? You getting it? Make sure you get it. Okay. So then, what is this king talking about? But Zina, are you not understanding it? Thank you, Donna. Zina, are you, is it making now sense if you read context? Guys, what are you learning from my studies? Context. What you guys are allowing to be done to yourselves is allowing people to take verses out of a chapter, explain those verses, but you never go back and read the context of the verses. Why not? Why don't you do that? I'm not saying this to be humble or condescending. I'm not better than you. I'm not smarter than you. I'm not. Everything good I have is from the triune God, the same triune God who loves you and will give you the same wisdom. If you show God, you want to know. But if you show God you're lazy, he won't give you wisdom. If you show God you're just going to let someone spoon feed you without going back in context and saying, Holy Spirit, I'm going to go back and read that chapter. Show me where this man is right or wrong because you are my teacher. You are my God and I trust in you. If you don't do that, he's not going to honor laziness. Right? Do you think I'm some gene? I'm not. Just go back and read context, man. Why do you let someone quote 12 and 15 and sit there? Say, hold on. I want to go back and read it. What, where does this chapter start at verse 3? And you read it to the 20. Hey, man, this is the king of Babylon. Now, let me explain something that's a fact of history. This is historical fact. Did you know the difference between the king of Israel and the kings of the nations? You know what the difference was? One major difference? One major difference? One major difference between the kings of Israel 
and the kings of the nations. The kings of Israel knew they were not God, but human beings appointed by God. The kings of the nations all thought they were gods on earth, the offspring of gods and goddesses. Pharaoh thought he was a god on earth, the son of Ra. Alexander the Great thought he was a god on earth, the son of Zeus, right? Gilgamesh believed his mother was the god goddess N N uh, Ninurga. They all thought they were gods, sons of the gods and goddesses. And God is mocking them. He's saying, no, you're not. You're no gods. You're not the offspring of gods. You're human maggots and I want to kill you dead as the human maggots that you are. He's mocking them. Right? He's mocking them. Right? So what God is saying to the king of Babylon, you think you're a god, and you think you can rival me, but I'm going to kill you dead like the maggot that you are, and when you're burning in Hades, will you still think you're a god after I humiliate you? And bring other nations to destroy you? You catch it now? You understand the language is not about a spirit being, but a human being who thinks he's a god on earth, who can rival God. And God is saying, when I kill you dead, and I damn your soul to Hades, along with the other kings of the nations who thought they were gods, and I damn their souls to Hades, will you still think you're a god? You with me there? Now let me prove to you that the king of Babylon thinks he's a god on earth and he can rival God. Do you remember the Assyrian king? And you got to read this on your own. Read Isaiah's, Isaiah chapter 36, 37. The Assyrian king, my ancestor, Sanchirub, Sennacherib, sent the Rabshakeh to tell Hezekiah, don't trust in the fact that you think your God will deliver you. Did any of the gods of the nations save them from the hands of my king? Do you see the arrogance? Rabshak is telling Hezekiah, none of the gods of the other nations were able to save them from my king, attacking them, slaughtering them, subjugating them. Neither will your God be able to do so. Do you see the arrogance? The king of Assyria thinks he is powerful enough to defeat the God of Hezekiah. That's Isaiah chapter 36 and 37. Yeah, Medic, don't be hard on yourself, brother. It is a joy for me to serve you, and I love you for the sake of Christ. All I'm asking you is be patient. Just be patient. Right? Guys, you understand what the Rabshakeh said? Hezekiah, your God can't deliver you out of the hand of my king, Sanchirub, Sennacherib, because none of the gods of the nations were able to save their people from my king. Hezekiah, in his arrogance, thought he was powerful enough to defy the God of Israel. That's the king of Assyria. Now let's see what the king of Babylon says. Isaiah 47, verse 1. Isaiah 47, verse 1. I'm almost done. With this topic, and I'll do Ezekiel 28 maybe sometime this week, right? Isaiah 47, verse 1. Some person was condemning me for being loud. I hope being loud doesn't annoy you. Isaiah 47, verse 1. Come down and sit in the dust, O virgin daughter of Babylon. He's talking now to the Babylonians. See the context? Sit on the ground. There is no throne, O daughter of the Chaldeans, for thou shalt no more be called tender and delicate. Now notice what the king of Babylon said in his arrogance. Isaiah 47, 8 and 10. Verse 8 and 10. Isaiah 47, 8 and 10. Watch here. Watch here. Notice the language. He mocks God, folks. Notice the Babylonian king. Notice how he speaks. Therefore, hear now this, thou that art given to pleasures. Watch. Watch what the king of Babylon says. That dwellest carelessly. 
that sayest in thy heart, I am, and none else besides me. Wow. Do you see the arrogance? The king of Babylon mocks the language of God. God says, I am, and there's none beside me. The king of Babylon says, I am, and there's none beside me. And God says, really? You're going to speak as if you're me? You're going to mock me and speak as if you're God like me? You're going to say to yourself, I am, and there's none like me? You sure? You're going to talk this way and live and get away with it? Basic, we have no verse in scripture that says Satan wanted to exalt himself to the level of Yahovah. We don't. Nothing explicit. You with me there? He's not the only one. My Assyrian ancestors, even the king of Assyria, said likewise. Zephaniah chapter 2, verses 3 to 15. Zephaniah chapter 2, verses 3 to 15. Okay, we're almost done. Zephaniah chapter 2, verses 13 and 15. Zephaniah 2, verses 13 and 15. Watch here. And he will stretch out his hand against the north and destroy Assyria, my ancestors, and will make Nineveh a desolation and dry like a wilderness. Why? Here's why God is going to destroy Assyria and leave the Assyrian a widow. Verse 15. This is the rejoicing city that dwelt carelessly, that said in her heart, I am, and there's none beside me. You too, Assyria? You too, Assyria? Like Babylon that came after you? You too, king of Assyria, you say you are and there's none beside you? Mimicking the language of God, rivaling God, mocking God in your heart, claiming to speak in a way that only God can speak? You too? And because of that, I'm going to destroy you as well. Okay, do you see what's common among these kings? They all thought their gods on earth, the offspring of the gods and goddesses, and that they're powerful enough to rival Yahovah and even defeat him in battle. And there you see the satanic influence. Because what was Satan's temptation of Adam and Eve? You can be like God. So anyone who thinks he's a God and can be like God, they're under satanic influence because that's what Satan tempted Adam and Eve with. You will be like God. You can rule yourself. You don't have to answer to him. So if you want to see a sure sign of satanic influence, if not demonic possession, when a person thinks he or she is a god or goddess, that's clearly a sign of satanic influence, if not possession. You got it there? So then why does this king say, I will ascend to heaven? And why does God say, I will cast you from heaven? Because the king is a human <clears throat> Ruler who in his arrogance thinks he's a God who can rival God and challenge God and says, oh, really? So you can you think you can ascend to my heights and rival me? Really? The moment you ascend, I will damn you to hell and hurl you to the earth. In other words, it's not literal, folks. It's not literal. Besides, let me ask you a question. If it's literal, notice the origin of the king. Did this king originate from heaven or from the earth? Was he on the earth who went to heaven and was hurled down? Or was he in heaven and hurled down? According to Isaiah 14, 12 to 15. This king, was he in heaven who was hurled down or on the earth who went to heaven and was cast down from there? The earth, right? Because that's the context, Isaiah 14, 12 to 15. Well, then how can it be Satan if you believe Satan originates in heaven? That Satan dwelt in heaven, sinned in heaven. And was cast down from heaven. You catch it now? Now let's finish it. Let's continue reading 16 to 23. I'm almost done. 16 to 23. Let's finish it, guys. Now read with me. We're almost done. I hope it was deep, educational, challenging. Now pray for me because, you know, people are going to attack me, try to discredit me, and attack me personally because I called out. Few people, one a heretic and one who's compromised. Zena, the question was, 
This is what I was asked. So you're saying that Satan didn't want to exalt himself to be like God? I said, there's nothing in the scripture that says Satan wanted to exalt himself to be like God. That doesn't mean he didn't want to be like God. It means you have nothing in scripture that says that. No, he wasn't cast out of heaven, basic, because if he was, how does he have access to heaven? How can he go to heaven and speak with God and ask God's permission to do stuff? He will be barred from heaven when Michael and his angels cast him to the earth. But that happens in the latter days, right before the return of Christ from heaven. No, Zena, what you read was Isaiah 14. So you're getting confused again. It's Isaiah 14, the king of Babylon called Lucifer, who wanted to exalt himself to God. So that's where you're getting confused, Zena, because you keep thinking that's Satan. That's the only chapter that speaks of someone who wanted to exalt himself to be like God. You see your confusion, Zena? You see your confusion? Sal el Nom. Satan travels the earth to tempt people, but he goes to heaven and asks God. For permission. The book of Job. Zechariah chapter 3. But the time will come. He'll be barred from heaven. And he won't have access to God's heavenly presence. We don't know that Jeremiah Jose Veras. That's what I'm trying to say. I don't know. Because scripture is silent brother. If the scripture is silent Jeremy. We have to be. He may have wanted to be like God. But if you ask me show me the verse. I can't. You, get, you see my point? Chan, I'll get there. Guys, be patient. I'll get there. I'll get there. Zena, I'll do a talk on Job chapter 1 and 2, but that's it. I'll do a talk, God willing, on Job chapters 1 and 2 because it deals specifically with Satan. And I'll unpack it, all right? Lord willing. You guys want me to do that? I'll do on Ezekiel 28, the anointed cherub. Is that Satan? And Satan going before God in the book of Job, Lord willing, this week. If you pray for my health. Pray for my holiness, pray for my girls, and pray for the support, and God save me out of my trials. Okay, now, let's finish this part. Let's finish it. Guys, we didn't finish Isaiah 14. I can't be here all night. Let's finish it. Isaiah 14, 12, uh, Isaiah 14 16 to 23. Let's read. No texting, read, because I want you to read now. Further proof, it's not speaking of Satan. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man? Bam. Did you catch it? Is this the spirit, or does it say, is this the man that made the earth to tremble, that did shake kingdoms? Did you guys catch it? Right after mentioning Lucifer being thrown down to hell, it says, is this the man? Wait, wait, Isaiah, why didn't you say, is this the anointed cherub or the angel? Why would you say, is this the man that made the earth to tremble, that did shake kingdoms, that made the world as a wilderness and destroyed the cities thereof, that opened not the house of his prisoners? Notice verse 18. All the kings of the nations, even all of them, lie in glory, everyone in his own house. Now notice this, folks. Please read. Read 19 with me, please. Please. But thou art cast out of thy grave. Wait. How does a spirit being have a grave? How do you bury a spirit bring, being in a grave? You, king of Babylon, you, the man, you'll be cast out of a grave. You won't have an honorable burial because it was considered disgraceful and shameful not to be given a honorable burial. And so God is saying, I'm going to shame you to such an extent you won't even have an honorable burial. And as the raiment of those that are slain, thrust through with a sword. Wait, wait, wait. How do you thrust a spirit being with a human sword that go down to the stones of the pit? Now let's read 20. Thou shall not be joined with them in burial. Wait. You're telling me Lucifer won't have an honorable burial, which was considered one of the most dishonorable things to do to a dead body? But how can Lucifer be the devil when the devil is a spirit and you can't bury a spirit in a tomb? Because thou hast destroyed the land and slain thy people. The seed of evil shall never be renowned. 21, 21, prepare slaughter for his children, for the iniquity of their fathers. Wait, wait, wait. Satan's children has ancestors. So Satan has ancestors that they do not rise, nor possess the land, nor fill the face of the world with cities. 22 and 23. For I'll rise up against them, saith Yahovah of hosts, and cut off from Babylon. End of story. 
It begins about Babylon. It ends with Babylon. Verse 22 and 23. Cut off from Babylon the name and remnant and son and nephew, saith Yahovah. I will also make it a possession for the bittern and pools of water, and I will sweep it with besom of destruction, saith Yahovah of hosts. Okay, guys. Convince me it's talking about Satan. Did you hear all of that? Did you hear me? Convince me it's about Satan. He's a man. He won't be given a proper burial because it was considered one of the most dishonorable things to do to a human being, not bury him properly, right? And then God says, I will cut off from Babylon all its resources and make the land desolate. Convince me it's about Satan. So in the historical context, who is Lucifer? Who is Lucifer in Isaiah 14? Yes, Brian, you can say that. Thank you, brother. You can say that the king of Babylon was influenced by Satan, possessed of Satan, and Satan worked through him. Because behind every evil human ruler, there is an evil spirit. You can say that. However, in the context, it is about the king of Babylon. You can say, in condemning the king of Babylon, Satan's being condemned, which would be true. But still, the language is not about Satan. It's about the king of Babylon being humiliated. Convince me now, Mike Kaiser, Mike Winger, convince me that this is about Satan. Lucifer is the Latin translation of Halel. It's found in the King James Bible. And I believe there are translations that follow the King James Bible that use it as well. But the Hebrew is Halel. So I hope I made my case. I hope I made my case. I'm almost done. I, you. I hope I made my case. You cannot use this to talk about the origin of Satan and why he fell. You can't do it. You can't do it. This chapter does not address. That's my boy. I know. We're talking like. Uh, this chapter does not address the origin of Satan, the nature of his sin, and his fall from grace. Right? Now, to no, Susan Baker, it's okay. She's a sister. Now, to answer the question, are we told what Satan was before he fell? And are we told why he fell? Number one, we know Satan is a spirit creature. But we're not told exactly whether he is an angel or a cherubim slash seraphim. You can make a case that he may have been a cherubim seraphim, but it's not explicit. It's not explicit. Jeremiah 15, 16, I love you, brother. <laughs> Keep praying for me so I won't be unnecessarily offensive and turn you guys away. But keep loving you and teaching you. Ask the Spirit to keep speaking through me to bless you for the glory of Christ. There is only one place in Scripture, folks. There's only one place in Scripture where we're given indication as to the nature of Satan's sin. Did you know that? There's only one place in Scripture. And it's not in the Old Testament. It's not in the Old Testament. It's in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 6. And it's in the reference of bishops not being recent converts, recent to the faith. Why? Because they may be condemned by the same sin that condemned Satan. 1 Timothy 3, verse 6. There you go. 1 Timothy 3, verse 6. Not a novice. He can't be a recent convert, a bishop. Lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Bam, there it goes. Satan was condemned because of pride. He got puffed up, became proudful and arrogant, which led to his condemnation. But notice we're not told what the nature of his pride was. Folks, if the Bible is silent, you be silent. If the Bible doesn't tell us, 
what exactly Satan was. We know he's a spirit creature, but was he an angel or a cherubim slash seraphim? And doesn't tell us the nature of his pride. Don't go above and beyond scripture. Shut up and be silent. Don't presume to speak on behalf of God. God in his wisdom wasn't pleased to reveal that to us. So let me leave you with Deuteronomy 29, 29. Deuteronomy 29, 29. Hit the like button, subscribe, pass it on. Pray God will sustain me for many more years to glorify Christ. And if God is pleased to bring a godly companion to work with me, to spread the message and not hinder me, if that's his will. Deuteronomy 29, 29. The sacred things belong unto Yahovah. The sacred things belong to the Yahovah our God. But those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. Learn this, etch this in your heart. If God hasn't revealed it, shut up about it. It belongs to him to know, not for you to know. Focus on the things he's revealed. Build on the things he's revealed. Understand the things he's revealed. Where he's silent, shut up. You got it? Where God has chosen to be silent, and hasn't been pleased to reveal it to us, shut up. And I say that to myself. Shut up, Sam. Deuteronomy 29, 29. The sacred things are his. If he wanted you to know, he would have revealed it. You want me there? So, Lord willing, I may be on Sunday. I may be on Sunday. But God willing, I'll be back in the saddle next week. Again, pray for my host in his graciousness, him and his wife and family are allowing me to stay here for free. Two weeks. He's even giving me his car to travel. Saving me money I don't have because we're in ministry, right? Pray for this brother. Subscribe to his YouTube, YouTube channel, Idiotai Apologetics, right? His YouTube channel is Idiotai Apologetics. Subscribe. Pray for him and his family. Pray for their provision. Thank, thank the Lord for him, for being gracious to me. Pray for me. Pray for my travels. Pray for my safety. Pray also, because I'm going to a convention to meet some Assyrians, that God will use this time to refresh me, bless me, and fill me with his joy and love. Pray for my daughters. God fights for them. I have a big trial in the next 60 days. Pray God delivers me from it. Pray that God will continue to make me holy, give me more wisdom, enable me to preach more clearly, boldly, without compromise. Right? <clears throat> Subscribe to my channel, hit the like button, and also prayerfully consider supporting the ministry because we do full-time ministry, and I need more supporters to continue to do this so I can stand on my feet for the sake of my kids, for the glory of Jesus, right? Hope you're blessed. Christ <clears throat> is alive. Christ is life. He is reality, and he loves us with an infinite love, and he's almighty to save. And if you belong to him and you're covered by his blood and filled with the spirit, you will never perish because he'll preserve you. Amen. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We love you. We're in love with you. Help us to love you more. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Jesus Christ is Yahovah to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Pray for me. I'm going to that convention. Pray that God will just show up in a mighty way to bless my heart and refresh me. You know? Because look, brothers and sisters, as I confessed in the beginning, I'm all alone right now. So sometimes lonely, but never alone. Pray that Jesus will be with me and bless my heart. Okay? Love you guys. May the Lord bless you and watch over you. Take care.